just a touch away. Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Quint, India's first digital live streaming business news service. I'm Nita Chan, you're watching Indian Open. Let's go straight to the headlines at this hour. Asian equities mirror US peers to trade with deep cuts. The Nikkei is down more than 3%. The SGX Nifty is trading down nearly 50 points. Retail prices increased by 3.31% in October to come in at a 13-month low. Industrial production grew by 4.5% in September. RBI Governor Urjit Patel met Prime Minister Narendra Modi last week to find a middle ground ahead of the central bank's board meeting, as per sources. And ILNFS invites buyers for two of its subsidiaries, kicking off the asset sale process to revive the debt-laden group. And in results, Jet Airways stays in the red despite a one-off gain and lower maintenance costs. And imagine, we didn't even talk about Aisha in the headlines. It's just such a day which is filled with news. But none more so than the world markets, and they were in a bit of a tizzy. The, the U.S. markets came off and came off quite a bit. Uh, Apple led the route on NASDAQ as well, but it was not just the NASDAQ. Dow and S&P came off too, and that mirrored what was happening in the other markets. So NASDAQ down about 2.78%, but S&P down about a couple of percentage points. Dow Jones down about 600 points. Um, there were some ramifications in the European markets as well, which remember when we shut shop for trading in the green, but because of what's happening to the dollar, oil and the US markets, the European markets came off as well. And it's showing in the way the Asian markets are trading in the session today. Almost all of them have gashes. Nikkei, a strong one, about 3% lower. Uh, Hang Seng just about 1.67%. Compared to the Nikkei, that's not too much. And the SGX Nifty indicating a start which could be about half a percent in the red. Keep in mind, we corrected about a percent yesterday while the other markets didn't. So there's a bit of a pullback that happened in our markets already. The dollar is advancing yet again. And that is likely to put more pressure on the EM currencies. Um, in fact, this, this chart which shows how in lieu of what's happening to oil and gold, the dollar uh, is moving up as well. And there is a bit of a problem on the tech sentiment too. So all of that is leading to pullbacks in the markets and strength in the US dollar. Now, what's happening in our markets? So that's the key thing. As I said, the Indian markets corrected ahead of what happened uh, ahead of what happened in the world markets yesterday or what happened in the Asian markets as well yesterday. Market breadth for India at least was at the lowest point or the worst point of the day in terms of advanced decline ratios. And while it was a low volume day and it showed some positive flows from the FIIs, because the FIIs put in about 832 crores versus DIs pulling out 1,074 crores, I don't think that there will be any bit of a respite. As would be the fact that while the mid caps and the small caps have bounced back, they are not in the overbought territory. So frankly, if you look at the RSI indicators, and they were deeply oversold a few days back, they've now started coming up, but nowhere near the overbought region. Uh, for the Nifty Midcap Index. The only problem is that I don't think the markets really take heed of that, that because it's not overbought, go out and buy the midcaps. If indeed the large caps were to tumble today, I doubt that the midcaps and the small caps would be too far off. Now, you know, multiple reasons. You could argue that we, we fell yesterday in anticipation of what was coming, though I doubt it is difficult, it is possible to anticipate what the US markets would do, or maybe because of the election nervousness uh, and because the state election started yesterday, or the fact that crude showed a bit of an uptick as well. So multiple factors factors could have led to this 1% fall in trade yesterday. Whether it will continue or no also remains to be seen. But because of what the world markets are doing, safe assumption that we might have a bit of a fall today. The macro data came in okay, though I must say. CPI inflation at least once again surprised positively. A print of 13-month lows at 3.31% YOY. A sharp slowdown in food inflation with lower inflation for a lot of other categories including clothing, footwear, housing and fuel and light components as well. So all of these categories came off. Food inflation was sharply lower. That should only augur well. And in amongst key news, something that we put out on our social platforms at about 10 p.m. last night, uh, people familiar with the matter have said that the Prime Minister met RBI Governor Urjit Patel on Friday. Uh, they met ahead of the November 19th board meet to ease out any kind of uh, issues or come to a middle ground of sorts. Nobody quite knows what the 
what the discussions in the meeting were obviously so but this is an important thing to monitor as well arguably to a lot of people's mind this is a lot more important than what happens to the world markets over the course of the next seven days so let's see hopefully this uh, tries uh, this brings about some bit of diffusion of tension if there was in the first place let's wait and watch uh, However, all of this is macros and for the trade setup. What is also important is to try and figure out what are the stocks that will react today at about 9 a.m. or 9.15 a.m. when the markets open up. So three or four, all numbers based today because a lot of results came out and a lot of stocks could react thereof. So uh, there is, I start off with the smaller ones, over 1,000 crore loss each for BOI as well as UCO Bank. Asset quality improved marginally for BOI at least, but let's wait and watch. Maybe there's some more pain in store for these names. We'll talk more about these a bit later on. Losses stay higher for Jet Airways. Another 1,000 crores loss after the Q1 loss of 1,000 crores. And I won't give too many numbers because Summit has got this whole sort set of data crunching. And we'll also try and tell you what, will ha what could happen to the stock. It's very difficult to say, frankly. Uh, with all that crude is doing, you never know what the sentiment on Jet Airways could be. But the numbers leave a lot to be desired, I must say. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if it starts off slightly lower. It was a reasonably strong quarter for Nalco as well as JK Paper. But follows in with what some of the paper companies are doing. So interesting one at that. And Aurobindo Pharma, I'm sure we'll talk about it in the huddle as well. But I was just scanning the brokerage notes and the numbers came in slightly better than what the street was working with. Credit Suisse note, some set up, but they're saying, they are of course maintaining the target uh, and outperform with the target price of about 840. But essentially a strong beat in the US and strategy of higher inventory delivering results for the company. This is what Credit Suisse's view is, but I saw a couple of other brokerages as well. All of them seem to be positive. As I said, we'll talk about this in the huddle in greater detail. So won't dwell on too much on this one. But one small piece of good news as well in addition to what happened to Nalco and JK Paper. So mixed bag on the results front. Some will react positively, some will not. But let's try and tell you what's lined up on First Word today. It's the collection of the top editorial stories that we believe we should bring to you. Summit first comes in to take us through the Jet Airways numbers and the mammoth amount of losses that the airline is pump putting in or clocking in almost every single quarter. Then Yatin then joins us to tell us why brokers are still betting on Aisha Motors despite the Royal Enfield numbers missing estimates. Tata Steel, of course, uh, the latest acquisition, Bhushan Steel, may aid its numbers in the second quarter. Nikki tells us how and why. And then an important development. The Island FS board is testing waters by putting uh, two of its subsidiaries on the block. Sajid joins us to tell us more. And Ida, of course, tells us what contributed to the October CPI coming in at 13 month low. So it's a packed first word. Let's get started with Jet Airways. It's still stuck in turbulence as the beleaguered carrier reported a third consecutive loss. A one-off gain, however, may have cushioned the fall. Samit Sarkar is standing by with the fine print. Samit, uh, were you surprised with the numbers? Well, it was on the expected lines. People were expecting a loss in this quarter and it has come out with a loss. But then we'll have to see. But people were actually uh, expecting for some good news coming in from the asset monetization part, but that was not, not reported in the second quarter. Now, if you see the numbers that Jet Airways has reported, now if you see the headline numbers, the company's revenue was higher by nearly 9.5% compared to last year because of passenger growth and because of one-off in the revenues that were there. Now, if you see the EBITDA, which is one of the key profitability metric for an airline company, now there it reported a loss of close to 346 crore rupees and on the bottom line front also there was a loss of close to 1,297 crore rupees. Now, the revenue of the company, now that included a one-off of close to 111 crore rupees which is related to an expected refund from a lesser towards the maintenance cost however the company has still not received this and is expecting to receive this in the third quarter or in the next quarter or in the fourth quarter of financial year 2019 now it was a weak quarter for jet airways because of weaker rupee higher crude prices and because of lower ticket prices seen in the second quarter now rupee depreciated by nearly nine percent because of which the company reported a foreign exchange loss of close to 417 crore rupees now fuel cost was higher for jet is because of higher crude prices but the quantum of increase for jet was higher than usual now if you see in the second quarter ATF prices were higher by nearly 41 percent but jets fuel cost per seat kilometer now that was higher by 44 percent now this is despite the fact that company has more capacity deployed on the international routes which enjoy a benefit of lower taxation so that will be one thing that investors have to see why 
it has come off uh, such a high for jet airways now cost other than fuel was also higher by nearly 8, 9% to close to 3.38 rupees per kilometer due to higher rental cost higher finance cost and foreign exchange losses now if you see the yields which measure the average earnings per passenger per kilometer now that declined by nearly 6% to close to 4.18 rupees due to pressure in the ticket prices and if you see the geographical breakup of uh, jet airways revenue you can clearly see where most of this pressure is coming in now on the domestic front if you see the company's passenger growth was 5% but its revenue declined by 1.2% on the international front the passenger growth was 5% but the revenue growth was 18% so you can clearly see most of the pressure for jet airways is coming in on the domestic front and that's the reason the yields have declined for the company lastly on the balance sheet side because of losses on excess of more than 2500 crore rupees in the first half of financial year 2019 the company's total liabilities have increased by nearly 18% to close to 22700 crore rupees now this total liabilities not only include the long term and the short term borrowings of the company but also its trade payables and other financial obligations so i mean so you know if i look at what happened in quarter 1 and quarter 2 they have been making efforts to reduce the non fuel costs but that's not quite aiding the overall efforts uh, what does this do to jet airways plans for reducing debt because they had laid firm emphasis on debt coming off i doubt that these kind of numbers can help it reduce debt meaningfully well i uh, actually i also doubt whether they will be able to reduce its debt because if you see uh for cost initiative uh, cost saving initiatives if you see the company in the last quarter said that they are looking to reduce their costs by nearly 2000 crore rupees over the next 8 to 10 quarters but if you see the kind of losses that the company have done in the first half it's in excess of 2500 crore rupees and also on uh, because of these losses that total liabilities have been increasing trade payables have been increasing yeah. which will again be turned off into short term debt so we'll have to see how that pans out and even i was just seeing this one interesting fact that in the last 10 years that is in the last 41 quarters If you see, the company has reported profits in 21 quarters and has reported losses in the 20 in 20 quarters. But the quantum of losses that the company has reported in 20 quarters Far. is close to 12,500 crore rupees, which is way more than what the profits that the company has reported in the 21 quarters. Yeah, so much for the volume growth that the airlines are clocking in. Somehow, it's not translating into numbers. Just one last quick question, Somit. Have any of the brokerages come out and given any kind of valuation parameters? I remember in quarter one, people were talking about seven times, seven and a half times. FY20 EBITDA so far EBITDA, there are no, no, no of the brokerage because they are still waiting for the conference call which will be held today post that i guess the notes would come in okay yeah, thanks amit thanks for putting that into perspective you know very difficult to call this one to be honest so we won't uh, because brokerage is also haven't quite given out the verdict as to what could happen in the stock but with losses like these i will be really surprised if the stock has a positive reaction could there be a positive reaction for aishar motors that's the other key question it missed analyst expectations in the september quarter as costly raw material and higher employee benefits weighed in on the numbers but yeah thing who looks at this space very closely johnson with his analysis of uh, what the numbers were like and what could happen to the stock yeah thing good morning um, so did you see some tigers or no <laughs> no tigers but uh, the forest minds the tigers okay fair call <laughs> let's talk about aishar then so uh, you know uh, if you look at aishar motors uh, the numbers were uh, Uh, i would say not broadly in line with expectation but a, a bit of miss on the operating performance uh, let's talk about the revenue growth uh, you know that was almost 11% uh, we had strong commercial vehicle demand and you know royal enfield demand in the second quarter because of which uh, we had a strong revenue growth profits were up only 6% to come in at 550 crores uh, tad lower than the street expectations ebitda came in 7% higher to come in at 730 crores margins compressed by almost uh, you know 120 basis points or so 1.2% Uh, to a level of uh, 30.3%, and there were various factors because of which the margins got impacted. Several one-offs also. Uh, I would like to add, uh, given the fact that uh, you know uh, the street would read otherwise. Now uh, you know two three clarifications which the management gave. Of course, uh, we had the higher uh, uh, employee cost and raw material cost which have impacted most of the auto companies, but the profits were hit by one time. uh you know uh, uh expense in the international market re regarding the launch of uh, royal enfield 650 uh you know so because of that marketing expense we had a one time hit on the mar um, margins we also had uh you know uh the management guiding about the further production impact at the chennai unit because of the employee strike uh, we have uh, the strike related production loss pegged at close to 800 to 900 units uh, per day at the chennai plant Uh, so you know that is something that the markets would not like at this point in time uh, because uh, you know almost 800 to 900 kind of a unit uh, run rate per month uh, could be detrimental for the earnings growth especially when the, you know the company is heavily dependent on the, its profitability on the royal enfield end of the business oh that's interesting now yatin 
One is what the numbers look like. Two, I don't know if you've got a chance to speak to your brethren in the analyst community or brokerage notes, etc. Mm -hmm. What is the verdict looking like? Uh, so, you know, most of the analysts have cut the target prices uh, given the fact that the volume outlook for Royal Enfield is slightly lower. Uh, so, uh, Query, uh, you know, maintains an outperform. However, they have cut the target price uh, to 30,000 from a level of 37,000. And they say that the earnings will be impacted by lower sales volume. Margins, uh, of course, uh, this time have been impacted because of negative operating leverage. And more importantly, the FY19 production cut by the management is the tune of 25,000 units uh, because of which uh, you know they have adjusted the target price. Not only that, uh, we have CLSA which has uh, maintained a buy with a target price of 30,000. They say that the second quarter miss is uh, you know on, on a very uh, lower volume base. Uh, several demand headwinds in the recent months uh, have come in but there are certain silver lining especially to do with the commercial vehicle business and the Royal Enfield growth slowdown is hurting uh, but uh, CLSA has said that they retain faith in the franchise. Uh, so uh, brokerages have not touched the ratings. However, they have adjusted the target price uh, given the fact that uh, uh, you know we have uh, that production cut uh, issue uh, of uh, Royal Enfield, which is yet to, yet to be resolved. Okay. Yeah. Then thanks for putting that into perspective. So that's Aisha Motors, and do watch out for this one as well. Uh, amongst the larger ones, of course, do watch out for Aurobindo Pharma. As I said, that stock likely to might react positively, I would believe, uh, because of uh, the numbers beating estimates by a margin. Okay, that's about the, the reviews. Now, let's take a look at uh, a preview as well. Tata Steel's consolidated performance may look significantly better after including Bush and Steel in its books. Profits are estimated to rise by nearly one and a half times for the September quarter. Nikki Mitch and Dani Johnson with the details. And more importantly, what should we watch out for? Nikki. Hi Neeraj, I'm going to start off with the top line growth on consolidated basis for Tata Steel. We're looking at a number which is going to be uh, a growth figure of 25% uh, to a number of 40,800 odd crore. In terms of EBITDA, we're looking at a 50% uptick there and margins are expected to be at 18% as compared to 14%. The profitability is expected to be around that 2,500 crore kind of a level which compares to a number which is less than 1,000 crore in the corresponding quarter, mainly on account of inclusion of Bhushan Steel in complete force in this quarter. So we'll start, so the financials will start reflecting the financials of Bhushan Steel or from Q2 onwards. Uh, other factors consolidated, volume is expected to be up by 12%. EBITDA per ton is seen at a number of 9,900 rupees. That's a key matrix for consolidated basis. Realization is seen higher at 56,000. Uh, on standalone basis, if you look at the volume figure, that's almost flattish. But if you look at the EBITDA per ton, we're expecting a 56% an uptick there to a number of 15,900 rupees. Now that's account, on account of higher prices despite the low volume on account of the strong demand that's seen in the market which has led to the up move in steel prices domestically. A bit up a ton for European steel business, if you look at that number, $56 per ton, key metric. That compares to $44 per ton in the corresponding quarter. This is despite the lower volumes that we're witnessing. And also Sequentially, we're looking at a number which is going to be a little lower uh, in terms of EBITDA per ton on account of the expenses that come in, uh, the maintenance costs that come in, and also the lower volumes which have waned sequentially. But then a few things that we like to keep an eye out will be the imports from China and the iron ore. We're going to be looking at outlook on steel prices, the consolidation of Usha Martin, newly bought an acquisition on Tata Sponge, and uh, the commentary coming in on the Tata Steel European business given that that's uh, facing a little bit pressure right now. Importantly, the EU probe in Tata Steel, Thyssen Group Steel merger, and the developments on sale of Southeast Asian units, given that PE firms had uh, interest, had expressed some kind of interest earlier this month in that business, and also the update on the status of Bhushan Power and Steel. Thanks, Nikki. We'll watch out for all of these. Uh, that's Tata Steel, and do watch out for this one in the results calendar today. On to the other stories. One month after taking charge, the new board of Ireland FS has decided to seek bids for two of the group subsidiaries. So the response will also help the six-member board draw up a resolution plan for the entire group, according to the release put out last evening. Sajid Mangat is here to take us through the details. 
Now, Sajid, yesterday in the edit meet, we were all, all talking about what's happening with RLFS, what's the status, there's some development here. How does all of this work? So, you know, you need to put it in perspective, uh, this RLFS security services and the settlement and the clearing operations, which uh, combined uh, has been put on the block. Uh, now, this is this was an uh, entity which was sold to Indus End Bank in January. The Indus End had uh, that agreement uh, happened in January and there was a binding agreement that happened in July of this year uh, to buy out this entire um, there was even an RBI approval which has come in for Indusind Bank to acquire this unit of Island FS, and now we understand that the deal has fallen through because now the uh, now the new board has put the entire these two companies in uh, into a public bidding, uh, and which means that now other. Uh, uh, Suitors can come and uh, look at it. Now, to give you a perspective, it's you know 81.36 percent subsidy of Island FS has a total to turnover of nearly 320 odd crores for FI18 and 45 crores in profits. Uh, they would have uh, taken a hit after the recent uh, Island FS issues, but uh, 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 but the valuation at that time, which uh, at the time of July, it was somewhere around 350 to 425 crores. That was the intrinsic value which Island FS was seeking, and the the negotiations between Island office in Indus in bank was happening at that front. Now I assume that the talks broke down because of the valuation because uh, the financial details were not given to public nor to the stock exchanges by neither by Alnfs or Indus in bank except for the fact that it was a binding definitive agreement to acquire these entities. Uh, putting these two is the easiest of the entire Island FS thing. Uh, of course, it brings in some bit of uh, certainty that now the new board is going to take asset by asset and take it take it to the market, uh, and not as a whole. So, if you remember uh, what Ireland Fest board or MCA had told the NCLT is that we are keeping all the options open, either take all of them as a one one off, or we'll break it down and send it sell it across. Uh, in either case, it's a long drawn process, and in the case of Ireland Fest securities and the settlement arm. Um, the process uh, is much more easier because they have already gone through the, to the stage of definitive agreement with I Indus in so uh, the preparation to take this arm to the market is much l smaller and that, and that's what uh, i think the board has done that you know because the deal fell through let's put it again back in the market and see how much value you can get from it uh, i'm not sure whether they can get the same amount of valuation which they were asking say in january or july but uh, it's up to market conditions which which is there because it's a market entity well, let's wait and watch. But Sajid Banga, thanks for putting this into perspective. News broke out late last evening and we'll tell you, just about telling you all that matters uh, with regards to LNFS. One more piece of, and of course you can read this story on our website, bloombergquin.com. One more piece of news and you can read that story too on the website and that's CPI inflation for the month of October, which was the lowest in over a year as falling food prices kept the headline numbers well within the Reserve Bank's target range. Ida Dugal reports. Interesting set of consumer price inflation data for the month of October. The headline index came in at 3.3 percent. That was below last month's 3.7 percent. It was also below the expectation, which was at 3.6 percent, and it was below uh, the 4 percent target of the MPC, which is the midpoint uh, of their target. That's the headline inflation. If you just want to read into that to draw implications for monetary policy at the headline level, uh, you would uh, sort of conclude that the MPC has no reason to hike rates, even when it meets in December. Remember, it had held status quo in October. While while changing its stance, uh, but uh, you know another rate hike based on the headline number would perhaps not be likely. Uh, the complications start when you start looking at the internals of the number. Uh, the headline inflation is being pulled down almost entirely by the food price uh, story. Uh, so consumer uh, food index, that's the CPI food index, uh, saw negative uh, inflation this time around. Uh, that's after a very small positive print in the previous month. Essentially, you're continuing to see pressure on prices of vegetables, pulses, uh, and also sugar. All of those three continue to see deflation and pull down the food index and then in turn uh, pull down the overall retail inflation index as well. Uh, but if you take that away, core CPI was actually higher this time. So core CPI uh, printed at about 6.1 or 6.2% depending on how you break up the core numbers. Uh, but that is telling you there is still some inflation pressure. It's just that the food price story, the low food price story is keeping the headline index uh, in uh, check. And that uh, distinction is something that at least will be debated if not uh, become the uh, point of decision. 
decision for the MPC. The more, uh, most interesting part of the data was the divergence that has continued in rural inflation and urban inflation. Link what's happening to food prices and to rural inflation and you get a sense that there is some sign of distress in the rural economy that is continuing. Uh, rural inflation printed below 3% this time around and saw a very steep fall uh, in the year-on-year -year rate between September and October. Food prices remain under pressure so you have to wonder uh, whether there is subdued demand in rural uh, India and where that is coming in from. Incomes perhaps remain uh, in check uh, and that's one reason. Some other indicators outside of inflation such as tractor sales etc have also shown some moderation which has led some economists to question whether rural demand uh, will be weaker in the second half of the financial year. So the CPI data gives you a good story which is that inflation is still in check. It gives you a bad story that it may be in check because demand side pressures are emerging at least in rural India. Interesting. Well, that brings us to the end of First Word, but lots more lined up on Indian Open. We discussed the September quarter earnings and business outlook uh, for InfoEdge with Managing Director Hitesh Oberoi. And Kia Industries plans to set up a 3 lakh kilometer cable capacity with Chairman Anil Gupta. But after this break, a full tilt towards the day's trade. Good news, got a promotion and a damn good raise. Congrats, beta. Wow, raise? Now take the insurance policy. Le le. Which company do you want? Choose the one that you have to do. That's good. But today's generation wants everything online. Easy premium payment options, loan facilities and a wide range of products. Papa, Didi, I will decide. Just send your links now. You both are the same choice. LIC. LIC. Trending with times. Every generation of every generation of the past. It's not about the award. It never is. It's about what went before and what came after. It's about getting recognized for the trust and confidence the customer has shown on us. We actually strive for it. It's about the brightest ideas and cleverest implementations. It's about innovation. It's about impact for manufacturers and help for shoppers. Tangible, meaningful impact for manufacturers who innovate and genuine help for shoppers looking for the best new things on the shelves. It's not about the award. It is about standing out. It's about being a giant even if you're really, really small. It's about picking the leaders of tomorrow, today. It's not about the award, it's about competing. It's about an unbiased, countrywide, face-to-face -face consumer survey that is unique and provides relevance and differentiation. Essentially, we're adding something to the marketing arsenal of product teams. It's about doing one's best and raising the bar each time. So it's about the end customer. You know, if you have that clarity, what is this need that you're trying to solve for the end customer? About exceeding expectations. About going all in. Coming. Product of the year. It's about feeling good that we are associated with product of the year. This is our 10th year. 30 years of finding brands that capture a billion. You need a lot of patience yeah. into the next industry cycle. Short-term pains for long-term gains. Buying is complicated. Selling is 10 times more complicated. If making money for investors were an art form, these folks would be maestros. Statistically speaking, there is likely to be a big drawdown sometime in the next 6-12 months. Is it much more difficult getting stocks right now? I think that is the basic nature of investing. Equity reflects the future earning potential. Circle of competence, one of the most important concepts in investing. Biggest risk that investor takes is when he pays the highest valuation at the highest margins. Get in on a conversation on the art of investing with India's top portfolio managers on Alpha Moguls. Thursdays only on Bloomberg Quint.
Welcome back. You're watching Indian Open right here on Bloomberg Quint across Asia. It's a sea of red. There's some selling pressure that's come in from yesterday's trade as well as from cues from the U.S. markets where tech stocks tumbled and leading to a a big sell-off even across Asia. That's S&P 500, Dow Jones, Nasdaq losing more than 2% apiece. For Asia as a pack, Japan in particular seems to be bogged down in the session, about 3, 3.5% 3 low. I think it's probably would be the, the lowest for uh, Nikkei 225 intraday. And Shanghai trades under by closer to about 4 tenths and Hang Seng loses about a percent and a half. For the SGX Nifty, we are trading under but not uh, as steep uh, in terms of the cuts as compared to the rest of the pack, just losing about half an odd percent. We already gave up closer to 1.2 percent in yesterday's session. Darshan joins in right now to take us through cues from the futures and options market right now. Darshan, good morning. Good morning, uh, Devina. And yesterday we were speaking that 10,500 to 10,700 is the tight range that the Nifty is looking at. It's broken on the downside, so probably we'll, we will cl open close to the 10,450 mark in trade. But yesterday only there were fresh short positions that were taken on the Nifty open. It just built up of 3%. That too on the short side. There was long unwinding that was seen on the Nifty Bank and look at the open interest decline of 13% and then the index was down almost 1% in trade. Now where are positions taken at this point of time from 10,500 to higher levels, call writers are active and from 10,500 to lower levels, put writers are active. So pretty much we are in this level uh, and today uh, in today's tra trading session, you will see that the call writers will become active. So the green lines will become much more and the red lines will go in below and, and similar case happened in trade yesterday. If we pull up what happened in trade yesterday at 10,000 10,500, 10,600, 700, 800 uh, and even at 10,500 put uh, call writers were active and put writers were forced to shed positions and, and similar case probably will happen in trade today. Uh, Adani Power is the only stock in the FNO band. The PCR for the Nifty was down in trade but look at the cut that came in on the Nifty Bank PCR. Now uh, some of the counters that you need to watch out for where positions were being built. Uh, uh, Shri Cement, uh, uh, Mahanagar Gas, Repco and uh, DCB Bank, all of them are, uh, uh, and, and, and I'm sorry, the first three, they saw fresh uh, long positions that were taken. Uh, Shri Cement uh, reacted post, negatively post the numbers but managed to recover. JSPL and DCB Bank saw fresh short positions. In terms of uh, short covering and long unwinding, you had counters like, you know, uh, OBC, G uh, 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 Just Dial, uh, PC Jewelers and BPCL, all of them saw long unwinding while Balakrishna Industry was the one that saw short covering, all of them had open interest decline anywhere between 9% to 12%. All right, Darshan, thanks very much for that. Uh, that's the futures and options space. You know, Neeraj, I was yesterday just looking at a comparison chart of the year-to-date performance of India versus the rest of the Asian market pack. And while obviously the difference between China and uh, our equity markets is huge because they're still in slump in, in the bear market, uh, we sort of were in line with uh, the Hong Kong market, but looks like the fall there now seems to have worsened. Whether or not we take a cue, we've been obviously our fall has come in, but it's still not as steep as the rest of the Asian market back and driven by uh, the sell off there. But whether or not we actually start to once again follow the route and see our markets as well start to correct, come back down under 10,000 is something that's uh, of keen interest to see. Yeah, I, I tell you what would have exaggerated the fall today if crude prices had continued to rise. Somehow crude came off a bit in the session yesterday as well. So that kind of softens the blow if there were to be in today's session. Still we'll holding have a around 70 yeah, for Brent. Yeah, so we'll have a start which is margin in the red today. Will we fall as much as maybe the Nikkei or etc. are saying? Difficult to say really. I think our technical experts will be best place to talk about that. But we'll have a start which is marginally in the red. It'll be a lot more stock specific I would reckon yeah. today. Um, yeah. And uh, do watch out for what happens to some of these oil sensitives because day in day out the cuts or the gains are 5% or 6% and it becomes extremely difficult for and a day trader. Especially for stocks trading on the index. So you have the equal yeah. bearing on the index as well. So your HPCL. Yeah, uh, HPPP, IOC. The, yeah, essentially up 5% on Friday down 6% yesterday. Today might be a brief respite as well. So it just becomes very difficult for an average day trader to or gauge, a positional yeah, trader yeah. really to try and take a call on what would happen to these. In fact, Moresh Joshi, fund manager at Angel Broking is with us. So many stocks to talk about which are in news. But Moresh, good morning. Can't, since we are talking about the OMCs, let me start off with that. How do you approach uh, or how do you decide if you are indeed bullish on the OMCs about when to enter? Because they are giving large moves and are extremely choppy these days. 
Well, absolutely they are. Good morning, Neeraj. Uh, so large element, as we've been discussing time and again, uh, and the two key variables for OMC is obviously is how the Brent pricing pans out and how the rupee moves against the dollar. So I think these two key variables are extremely sensitive in terms of how the earnings pan out for these OMC stocks. Uh, having said that, uh, I think since the volatility for both these variables might continue, you might see the volatility in stock prices as well. On the other hand, the kind of CAPEX plans uh, that these companies have announced, uh, they are going to have sort of an effect in terms of their cash flows from a medium term perspective. To top that up, again, I think the kind of uh, impact uh, it has in terms of specifically the one rupee imposition uh, on, on the OMC pack as a whole uh, is going to hit their marketing margins, which obviously gets offset because the other parts and the elements of their businesses, which include the pet camp business, uh, probably remain stable with increased volumes and realizations actually remaining stable. The pipeline business with throughput expected to remain extremely stable as well. And the expectations of their investments uh, in other subsidiaries. Uh, so the kind of dividend yields that these companies throw out, uh, I think even that can become a little bit of a question mark in terms of the elevated uh, numbers that we talk about. Uh, so I think it's a safer bet uh, that one remains on the sidelines. If you've not made any fresh investments, I think let this period pan out. Uh, let there be far more stability in both these variables. Uh, and if these stocks do come below the book value as they had come once the announcement was done, I think then it becomes a far more interesting proposition because it becomes very, very interesting from a value perspective. Till that point of time, I think you should probably stay on the sidelines and wait for these variables to probably stabilize. Uh, you know, just probably in the same flavor, Jet Airways reported numbers. What did you make out of that? You know, really struggling to survive out here, uh, making losses after losses, nine uh, straight consecutive fiscal years out of the last 11. The company has not managed to post profitable numbers. Uh, the pressures on the currency side causing that huge forex loss for them this quarter. How did you read into it? No, it's absolutely disappointing and it was expected to be so. Again, looking at the trend on how Indico had performed because of escalating fuel costs, uh, Jet was not going to be an exception in any case. Uh, having said that, I think the cost per available seat kilometer, uh, excluding fuel as well, was on the higher side and it clearly showed uh, the airline's inability to probably pass on the costs uh, in terms of fares. Uh, so in that sense, again, I think the yields uh, were disappointing and the company is trying to make efforts in probably trying to restructure its operations. Uh, but again, I think a negative net worth, you're probably still looking at a period where you're probably going to see cash flows getting affected uh, because of fuel costs still remaining at elevated levels. Uh, and that is going to take a toll in terms of their overall uh, yield movement. Now, the revenue per available seat kilometer is expected to improve because you're probably entering into a quarter which is one of the better quarters for aviation companies in general. Uh, holiday season round, Q3 expected to be strong. Uh, so to that bit, again, I think what the competition probably does in terms of pricing is going to be a key element. Uh, the available per seat kilometers and whatever they've done in terms of uh, probably maintaining their market share in terms of 14 odd percent, uh, I think that might play out in terms of uh, a long-term perspective. But from a short to medium-term perspective, I think these variables are obviously going to play against aviation companies in general. So yes, I think uh, disappointing set of numbers, but I think that was always expected the winner for aviation companies because Q2 is supposed to be the seasonally uh, one of the worst quarters that aviation companies probably face and escalating fuel costs uh, have added fuel to fire if I may add. Mm. On the valuation side though, if you have to put uh, in into Globe Spice Jet and Jet Airways, you know, which would look more favorable to you? There are obviously concerns as I pointed out for the industry as a whole, but then there are other concerns uh, for, for Jet in terms of what might actually go on in terms of uh, uh, the ongoing uh, uh, inquiries or whatever you call in terms of uh, uh, the, the uh, company proceeding. So in that sense, again, I think uh, like OMC stocks, I think it's better to stay on sidelines because again, Brent and rupee movement against the dollar, these two key variables are a huge uh, driver in terms of sensitivity to earnings. Uh, so out of the three, I think Indigo probably better placed, uh, but again, I think uh, one should really wait on uh, the sidelines, wait for declines, wait for stability on these variables before one tries to jump into these stocks. Okay, Mayuresh, um, just one quick question on Aisha Motors as well. Uh, do you think the stock can uh, show a big reaction or these minor disappointments can be taken on board? No, so at a certain bit, I think, looking at how the markets are reacting at this point of time, any disappointments are probably being taken in uh, 
the negative sense. But again, I think a large element needed of what you probably need to look out uh, from a medium to long term perspective, specifically for a medium to long term investor, is whether these production numbers and the volumes uh, can come back to normalization and improve thereafter. What they've probably done in terms of uh, the expectations of two key launches, the Interceptor and the Continental GT, the 650cc models, uh, I think one really expects a good amount of response to come through. Our channel checks probably have suggested that there is a demand for these bikes uh, expected as and when they are launched. Uh, on the other hand, I think whatever issues were uh, being, being faced by the company, whether it was because of the strike or the Kerala floods, uh, I think it was largely built in in terms of numbers expected to go down. Uh, but again, I think uh, the expectation largely of volumes uh, coming back to mean over the next few quarters, expectations of realizations remaining stable. And margins have been a little bit disappointing, but again, I think the expectations of input cost inflation, the expectations of uh, one-offs uh, related to marketing spends on new launches, I think that does take a toll. But it's a qualitative franchise in the end. So I think anybody who's holding on to the stock should clearly hold on. Okay, Mayesh, on so much more to talk about. Let's uh, go across to our research team uh, and talk about all the key stocks in news, uh, some movers as well, and stocks that are likely to get impacted because of the results that have come out. Uh, so Nikki, Agam, as well as Darshan join in to talk about all of these. Good morning to all of you. Darshan, let me start off with you. And you want, you're going to talk about Sun Pharma and what's expected, but just quick 30 seconds on Aurobindo as well. Yeah, so extremely strong set of numbers, a beat across all parameters. I think the important factor was uh, that debt came down uh, quarter on quarter. Uh, the U.S. sales were up over $300 billion, so they came in at $318 billion. Our estimate was uh, $300 billion. And brokerages have given this a thumbs up, so probably should react positively. That's the word on odd window. Okay. What about Sun Pharma? Yeah, so Sun Pharma, uh, what we're seeing is a 14% top-line growth, 14% bottom-line growth, and EBITDA growth of 22%, which means EBITDA margins will come in close to the 22% mark compared to a 21% mark that we saw last time around. Now, their large subsidiary, US-based subsidiary, Taro, has already reported numbers. Uh, on a year-on-year -year basis, they, it, it seems like it's a decline, but uh, it, it's come in much higher than what the street was anticipating. So on an estimated basis, yes, the numbers probably will be higher, and that has already been factored in. Uh, what what are we watching out for in uh, Sun Pharma? The first thing we're watching is uh, how the U.S. business has grown post the resolution of Halol. Uh, so more products will come out. Uh, what are the new filings? That is something that we need to watch out for. Uh, revenue growth also will be aided by the rupee depreciation that is there. Uh, no major launch was done in this quarter, but over the past few quarters, some of the important drugs have been launched, so the ramp up is something that we need to watch out for. And now they're focusing more on the specialty business, and that is why there will be increased R&D spends there, which will mean that EBITDA margin will not be as high as what uh, uh, you know it has it used to be in the past. What do you watch out for? The U.S. Uh, uh, initiative for Illuma. What exactly is happening there? Uh, update on the specialty product pipeline. In the U.S., uh, what their commentary is in terms of uh, the Indian markets uh, and, and the U.S. markets, and what's happening next with Halol and the important drugs there. So that's something that we need to watch out. Okay, watch out for this. And Aurobindo Pharma could react positively. I doubt Coal India will react too positively, Nikki. Numbers seemed in line with estimates. Actually, a good set of numbers. There okay. is a small accounting policy change which took place in Coal India numbers. The provision this time around had been netted off, have not been netted off, rather they've added back to the other income because of which the EBITDA figures are in line. X that, if you look at the numbers, they are better than what we were estimating. But we've gone with the X reclassification in line with most of the brokerages. Revenue is up by 22%. And if you look at the adjusted EBITDA, that's almost at 4,700 crore as compared to 876 crore. Margins at 21% as compared to 5%, lower base out there. Profitability at 3,084 crore as compared to 370 crore. Better e-auction realization along with cost optimization. Look at the raw material employee cost, contractual expenses. They've all been lower. And if you look at the bottom line performance, as I just suggested, that's been aided by other income, which is up by as much as 96%. Now, this comes on account of the income tax refund. Along with that, the provision refund, which usually is a part of provisioning expenses. So based on that accounting policy, we're looking at a sharp 96% jump out there. Volume, we've seen a sharp growth coming in on FSA volume and a raw coal volume. However, the e-auction volumes remain to be at that a muted level. But then look at the realization. E-auction realization has fetched the highest and probably has aided the earning of the company. E-auction realization up by as much as 54% to a number of 2,400 rupees as compared to nearly 1,600 rupees that we saw in the corresponding quarter. Okay, we'll watch out for these. Uh, 
this set of numbers as well, Coal India. Thanks for that, Nikki. But a bunch of other results, some stocks in news. Agam, what do you have for us? Right, I'm going to start off with Oil India's buyback. They, the board is going to consider a buyback on 19th of November. And at this point in time, they have cash and cash equivalents worth of 5,200 crores. But moving on to earnings, Bank of India, a very poor set of earnings coming through, and net interest income rising by less than 1%. We've also seen your losses widen quite substantially to about 1,156 crores as against 179 crores. Gen irrigation, on the other hand, good earnings coming through, 20% growth in its top line, margins expanding as and profits doubling to around 21.2 crores. Hathway cables, again, mixed earnings coming through, well, well, revenues remain flat around 131 crores. We've also seen a net loss figure of around 5.9 crores against a profit of 14 crores, and we are expecting some pressure there. And finally, JK Paper, in line with what we've seen for a lot of the other paper stocks, JK Paper has seen a rise of 17% in its revenues, profits rising 94%, that's almost doubling, and margins also expanding quite substantially on account of lower lumber prices and increased demand. So uh, we'll, be watch we'll be expecting a positive uptick for JK Paper today. Oh, should be interesting. Let's wait and watch. Agam, thanks for putting all of those into perspective. Um, well, JK Paper seems to be the easy one, Mayuresh. So I'll go in for the difficult one. Hathaway Cable at 30 odd bucks. Uh, the results slightly poor. But do you think that will have a material bearing on the, res on, the, on the stock price simply because there is this outstanding open offer that Reliance Industries has given at a price of about 32 odd rupees. What should somebody who is invested in Hathaway Cable do this morning? So again, I think whatever has transpired, Neeraj, specifically in terms of the deal contours, uh, should probably keep the stock uh, in, in, in probably good uh, stead. Uh, but a large element in terms of what might uh, be done within the space itself, and though we do not have a direct coverage on Hathaway Cable, uh, I think we still prefer uh, the broadcasters. Yes, there might be some uh, amount of apprehension that is getting laid out because of the OTT platforms, and they are making inroads uh, in terms of both the subscriber base uh, getting piled on as well as the plans that they probably come out with, which is compelling all these broadcasters to probably make huge digital investments uh, into their own uh, digital uh, platforms as well. Having said that, again, I think the kind of uh, ad revenue and subscription revenue growth that we've seen for a few of these companies uh, seem to be suggesting that, at least from a medium-term perspective, the earnings will still remain on track the competition from the OTT space will still be around. Uh, so I think Z is something that we continue to like within this space. No coverage on Hathaway is so difficult to commit. All right. Uh, our technical experts are also here with us. We've got Amit Harchekar as well as Hadrian Mendonka, both of them here with us this morning. Gentlemen, good morning to you. I'll start off with you, Hadrian. We made our approach towards 10,500. Uh, looks difficult to hold fort uh, at those levels now, considering the kind of cuts we're seeing on the SGX and the opening most likely will be on the lower side. How does one trade it? Absolutely, there is a weakness that is visible. Yesterday we saw a down day. Uh, we may see an extension of that down day even today. At least in the morning trades, uh, you know, uh, we are seeing a rising uh, uh, wedge pattern breakout uh, on the smaller time frame charts, uh, which is indicating initial signs of weakness. Uh, even the bank nifty on the other hand is for is broken down from a channel pattern which is uh, again not a good sign after consolidation of four or five days that uh, you know the bank nifty went through so uh, definitely the trade should be on the short side in uh, you know in the near term uh, on the upside uh, uh, resistance uh, continues to remain at 10,700 that's a little far off from your on but uh, the nifty is unable to even surpass the 10,600 10,640 mark failing to sustain above the same so I think keeping that as a stop loss, one can consider going short on the nifty on the downside. Amit, what's your index trade? Well, I would be quite uh, watchful for the markets at current levels. For one reason, we have a, a breakout in dollar index above 97. So we are expecting it to move towards 100. And on other side, from for a nifty perspective, we don't have a trade because we think uh, the breakout level for India weeks, that is placed at 19.82. We have not broken that. The moment we see a sustained move above 19.82, we are expecting weeks to spike to 26, 27. So that's a breakout wall level for India weeks. And for Nifty, uh, the maximum long positions has piled up at a price of 10,401 on the future side. If that gets broken, then probably uh, it would give an indication that you will see a lot of long unwinding in this market. But at this point of time, probably I would uh, avoid uh, taking any uh, aggressive trade on either side. 
Okay, what about your stock ideas, Amit? You've got an ONGC and a Tata Power. Well, uh, we think uh, Tata Power is a one stock which has clearly formed a reversal from a long-term downtrend. And any declines towards 73, 74 becomes a good buying opportunity. So we think 70 turns out to be the short-term breakout level. So that should be the stop loss for your long trade. We are expecting it to move towards 81. Second trade would be ONGC. It's trading towards a long-term su support. We don't expect that to get broken quite easily. So the trade would be buying with a stop of 149 on the futures. Uh, we are expecting the stock to move higher towards uh, 162. And last would be a sell on HDFC Limited. Here, we believe if you see Nifty Financial Index, that has formed an expanding wedge. And there uh, is a major risk if dollar index starts moving up, you will see a, a 6 to 7% cut in Nifty Financial Index. Uh, so we believe SDFC is one stock which could lead the fall in the near term. So what we are suggesting, keeping a stop loss of 1850 on a closing basis, we are expecting SDFC to slide towards 1700. Interesting. You don't normally see this a short on HDFC, but yesterday HDFC Twins and Reliance were amongst the principal contributors um, to the downside. Adrian, what are the stock recommendations from your side this morning? Yeah, both are on the short side. Uh, you know, the first stock that we are uh, uh, slightly bearish on is the Tata Motors. Uh, we saw very good relief rally in the past one, one and a half week, uh, but uh, again, uh, it's still not out of the woods and uh, it is uh, once again resuming its declining trend. Uh, we have also seen uh, the relief rally that, uh, you know, we saw uh, the slope has been again broken down. We are seeing a rising channel pattern breakdown on the daily charts as well. So I think one should not, uh, uh, you know, miss out on its opportunity to once again short sell Tata Motors November futures. We are expecting a short term target of 180, keeping a stop loss at 189 on the upside. Second stock that we are uh, bearish on is uh, uh, Kaveri Seed, KSCL November Futures. Uh, we are seeing a, a bearish engulfing pattern. Now, um, the importance of this pattern for KSCL specifically is that we have seen this bearish engulfing pattern created four times in the past one and a half months. And every time we saw this pattern created, we saw KSCL fall like a rock. So I think again, uh, we have seen uh, this pattern forming in yesterday's trading session with good volumes. Uh, one can consider short selling uh, KSCL. We are expecting a short term target of 475, keeping a stop loss at 493. Okay, um, gentlemen, on time now for a special segment, Bloomberg Edge, wherein J Yash Upadhyay tells us about a pattern that the Bloomberg terminal has thrown up on a stock. And Yash, good morning. What's the stock on your radar today? Uh, good morning, Neeraj. The stock today is actually Granules India, and the indicator we're going to talk about is the stochastic indicator. Uh, let's first try and understand what this indicator is. Uh, it is basically a momentum indicator, and what it does is it it helps in identifying when a price move is overextended and it measures the current price relative to the highest highs and lowest lows. Uh, a Overbought level is about above the mark of 80 and oversold is 20. A cross in, crossover indicates a buy or a sell signal. Uh, in this case, uh, in, in Granule's case, uh, the crossover over here is the blue line. Uh, that, uh, that has crossed below the white signal line uh, to indicate a sell signal. Now, we've seen that the price after correcting sharply from the levels of 120 had seen a, re a relief bounce from the mark of 90 to over 110. And now, uh, with the indicator turning uh, negative, we could see some amount of uh, uh, correction in the stock. All right, and how accurate is this indicator? So every time you went short when the indicator turned negative, uh, it would have given you positive returns of close to 20% in the last one year. Okay, not bad. Yash, thanks a lot for that. That's Granules India there that Yash is highlighting on Bloomberg Edge. Mahidesh, I want to come to you on Divan Housing Finance. Yesterday there was a, an intimation to the exchanges that they are looking uh, to issue uh, secured redeemable non-convertible debentures to the amount of 1500 crores issue will open on the 15th as a private placement um, and it's a triple uh, triple a care rated uh, paper what's your sense here and uh, do you think they're going to be takers for this so one really needs to watch out for that space they've been but a large element in terms of uh, housing finance companies whether it's dhfl or india bulls housing uh, a lot of uh, buyback has probably happened for the commercial paper that they have issued. Uh, so they are trying to instill confidence uh, that the liquidity freeze or the liquidity crunch uh, that a lot of the NBFC universe is facing and a few of the companies are facing, they probably have the right amount of uh, assets to probably take care of their liability. So the asset liability mismatch, uh, which was glaringly brought about for the universe as a whole, uh, 
probably is not there. So I think some amount of confidence is getting instilled. Now for the NCD in particular, I think at what rate or what yields uh, is it getting issued is going to be of paramount importance. Uh, and a large element in terms of the fresh borrowings uh, that a lot of these companies, including DHFL, will do, I think that obviously is going to have a bearing in terms of their NIMS and spreads. Uh, now how it will, uh, I mean, how will it will uh, probably reflect in terms of growth numbers, uh, both in terms of AUM and the advances growth and what kind of uh, yields do these advances actually go through over the next uh, one to two quarters is going to be very, very interesting. So I think it's a very interesting space. I think at what uh, rates are they able to raise these NCDs is going to be extremely critical. But again, I think growth uh, specifically in terms of uh, how the AUM and advances growth happens and what kind of an impact does it have on NIMS and spreads uh, will be interesting to watch. No doubt, I think valuations have become very, very attractive. But the street is very, very, very at this point of time in terms of uh, growth numbers. Uh, and I think it's going to be a wait and watch, at least for investors on this one. All right. Nonetheless, the stock was up about 4% or percent in yesterday's session, and so was it Repco Home Finance, which did okay for itself. Hadrian, any of these names? Yeah, Repco Home Finance uh, that you just mentioned is really looking impressive. In fact, uh, we've seen a consolidation of over four to five days in the previous week, and uh, yesterday's move is actually uh, you know leading to a fresh channel breakout on the upside. You saw good participation of volumes as well yesterday. I think uh, Repco Home still has a legs to move higher from here on. Uh, if uh, one wants to go long, one can uh, definitely go long at, at these levels. In the short term, we could see uh, targets of 425 to 430 on the upside, where the stop loss has to be stick strictly around 401, 402 levels. Interesting. Manish, uh, uh, a question that's coming up repeatedly, in, you know, in, in these times, it's difficult to figure out whether you want to buy stocks right now or you want to hold on for the next 200, 300 points. But, now, when I look back at the conversations that we had with experts this Diwali, a lot of recommendations came around the insurance space. What do you prefer to buy in the insurance space, if anything? And would you buy it right now at one go, or would you buy it in a staggered fashion? Well, Neeraj, I think it obviously makes sense to buy stocks in a staggered fashion because the volatility is expected to continue under the series of events. I don't want to elaborate on that one. But I think, I think insurance as a space looks very, very interesting. Uh, Again, underpenetration is something that is a well-known fact. Uh, but what is probably happening in terms of uh, these insurance companies actually changing their product mix uh, is going to have a huge bearing in terms of uh, both their business margins as well as the new business margins uh, that these companies are probably reporting. So the protection plan business, uh, where a lot of these life insurance companies are probably having a lot of focus on, uh, is a value creative product, uh, both in terms of uh, the premiums that they collect as well as the margins that probably get collected as well. Uh, the new business premium margins for a few of these players are inching upwards. Uh, and what you've probably seen in terms of gestation periods for all these companies uh, are now getting reflected in terms of uh, very, very positive embedded values. Uh, so core parameters like persistency ratios, when you're probably talking about a 60-month ratio or 81-month ratio, I think they are showing positive signs. Uh, the premium collections obviously are going to be very, very strong as you're entering probably Q3, Q4. And that is going to reflect very, very positively in terms of the return on embedded value. So yes, as a space, it looks very, very interesting. One really has to have a long-term view, but within this, I think HDFC Life, uh, SBI Life is something that I'll continue to prefer. But yes, I think it has to be done in a staggered way over the next few months. Something like, like a sip in these stocks uh, can very well suffice for long-term investors. Interesting. Maybe another other question, and I mm. want to ask Amit about this, but on a day or like yesterday, Titan managed to stay at the highest point of the day. And what can a stock like that, which seems to have masked the disappointment of the numbers, do in the near term, considering that the markets seem to be a bit shaky? Uh, but the numbers, and as Bhaskar Bhatt's commentary suggested, what a bit of a one-off, the tremors won't be felt in the yeah. quarters ahead. Yeah, the outlook there was, I think, what kept buoyancy on the stock price as well. People didn't give a, a really knee-jerk reaction just to the optical number there. Uh, of uh, the earnings fine print. But yeah, Titan approaching 900 now. Well, let's see whether or not uh, 1,000 is within reach for Titan. Amit, a Titan for you? Well, my sense is uh, as, the, as long as we have a, a closing above 870, the stock's uptrend seems to be remain intact. Uh, 
in in case we break 870 then this stock could enter into a trouble zone because then we would re-enter the uh, downward trend between uh, 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 750 and uh, uh, 870. So I would wait for a closing for 870 uh, if I want to uh, unwind any long trade. Okay. Uh, let's talk about a few other names. Uh, for one, uh, Tata Motors, that range is pretty pronounced now between 200 and 165 orders where it's been trading at. Uh, goes up to the level of 200, comes back down to about 160, 165. Now at trading at about 186, so on its way down. What would you do, Hadrian? Yeah, Tata Motors is one of our uh, sell, uh, uh, you know, recommendations that we've already spoken about. So I think uh, I would like to reiterate uh, that one can consider short selling around these levels. Short term target is uh, close to 180 on the downside, keeping stop loss uh, around 189 on the upside. Okay, we'll watch out for Titan, uh, rather Tata Motors as well in the session today, likely to start off slightly weak. And then, of course, watch out for a bunch of other names. Remember Aurobindo Pharma, we haven't quite discussed that, but maybe on open, if it starts off well, it'll be worth talking about Aurobindo Pharma as well. JK Paper is the other set of numbers which was rather strong and could start off well. And Nalco seemed to be a decent set of numbers. Let's see if there is a brisk start in the session today for that one. Yep. About 30 seconds left to go for market pre-open and we're looking at a softer start this morning in line with what the rest of Asia has been doing and not as steep but um, nonetheless in the red. Nikkei now down 3.2% percent you have got Hang Seng losing 1.3% while Shanghai gives up about half an odd percent. For our markets as well 10,452 is where the SGX Nifty is indicating a start you've got the ticks on your screen. Nifty down about a tenth of a percent and that builds on. We'll keep a close eye on how these prices will stabilize in a few moments from now but just the initial feeler is that it's not bad. In fact a slight positive bias is what we've opened up with. Uh, to take a look at what's uh, going to be uh, individual stock price moves looking like you've got a Bajaj Finance which actually is uh, topping the index uh, with gains of about 4 odd percent. Remember yesterday the stock lost 4 percent. Coal India, um, like Nikki highlighted, the numbers were a beat on the analyst expectations. The stock's up about 2 and a quarter. BPCL, HPCL, both of them looking strong in the session this morning. Reliance Industries, which was one of the key contributors in terms of losers yesterday, is gaining some traction today. Grassim, Bajaj Auto, Sun Pharma, Asian Paints is up in the green as well. Tata Steel looking strong numbers uh, uh, get reported today. HUL, HCL Technologies, Dr. Reddy's, these are some marginal gains of about a third of a percent to half an odd percent. But it's pretty even, Stephen, in terms of the advances and declines, at least on the index. Tata Motors is showing you a dip of 10 percent. That's an unnatural uh, uh, price action on the stock but like I said that range of 165 or uh, to 200 is something that the stock really sees uh, quite a bit. The stock has now recovered so 175 on it. ICICI Bank is at 3% uh, cut. Aisha Motors disappointing numbers down 2% and Z and an India Bulls Housing Finance down 1%. Jet Airways, before I talk about the currency, down about 10%. Don't quite know what the actual reaction would be. Might not be 10%, but suffice to say, won't be surprised if it starts off lower. Uh, frankly, there's no reason for the stock to move up higher, but let's wait and watch uh, and see what the reaction is on this one. The currency and the bond yields first quickly before we move on to some other mid caps. Uh, the rupee, well, interestingly, marginally in the green, I thought the dollar was trending across the board. But maybe the crude price fall aiding the currency mood today. Frankly, the last three days, there's been a near-perfect correlation between what crude does overnight and what the currency does the next morning. The bond yield should come up on your screen as well. 7.77. So, well, in and around those levels, really haven't moved too much from those levels. Tata Motors now a more realistic 4.5% lower. But this is in addition to the 4.5% that we saw uh, in, in the session yesterday as well. So let's wait and watch what happens to the DVR as well as the main stock. Uh, are, are the banks, which is Bank of India and Yuko Bank, reacting to those numbers? Uh, the losses were widening uh, high, but the asset quality improved ever so marginally for BOI. Uh, Yuko Bank margining the green, in fact. And Aurobindo Pharma and JK Paper, two strong numbers. Let's just see what's happening there. Aurobindo Pharma, about a percent higher. JK Paper, not that widely traded a stock, but about a couple of percentage points. Lastly, 
the two top losers from yesterday's session, Avanti Feeds as well as India Cements. And let's see what they are doing in the start today. Avanti Feeds marginally lower. India Cements, which lost about 6% yesterday, marginally lower in the session today as well. Let's first get a sense of what the top brokerages are saying in the session today. The top brokerage calls for the morning. Uh, Somit Johnson with that. Somit. Uh, so, Neeraj, and the big brokerage calls for the day today. First, we have is Nomura on Adani Posts. Now, the brokerage has maintained its neutral rating on the stock, but has cut down the target price on Adani Posts to 380 from 431. Now, according to the brokerage, Adani Posts has reported a strong delivery on volume front and has seen significant improvement when it comes to cash generation. But despite this, the stock prices have fallen, which the brokerage believes to be fair because of the because the rising interest rates have been impacting the asset valuations of the company. Now, along with this, an increase in pledge shares and financial weakness seen among other, uh, seen, seen among other key group entities is also an overhang on the stock. Second we have is Macquarie on Britannia Industries. Now the brokerage has maintained its underperform uh, rating. Macquarie has maintained its underperform rating with the target price of close to 4,210 rupees. Now according to the brokerage, the second quarter results were in line with estimates primarily on the back of strong domestic volume growth of around 12%. Now widening this direct distribution, increasing presence in rural markets and weaker states drove the volume growth of the company in the second quarter of financial year 2019, says the brokerage. Now, year on year, the company has seen its EBITDA margins expand, but going forward, the brokerage believes that significant margin expansion will be challenging for Britannia because of the higher ad spends, higher employee cost, and because of price competitions. Mm. All right. Sama, thanks very much for that. In fact, we were talking about our Rubindo Pharma at pre-open. Let's quickly get in an opinion on that. Mayuresh, how did you read into numbers for Rubindo Pharma? No, strong set of numbers, Devin, and again, I think the U.S. business outperformance was very, very evident. Uh, what has probably happened in terms of the India business, obviously because of the higher base, uh, did play out in terms of soft numbers. Uh, but overall, I think the business outlook probably looks very, very strong. Uh, even if one accounts for the elevated R&D expenses uh, that the company has reported in the quarter gone by, the margins still remained extremely strong. Uh, and to that bit, again, I think the NDA filings, 112, in fact, uh, which are still pending and the expectations of 3035 launch is expected to come through. ARV business expected to probably, again, stabilize with the injectable launches expected to, again, have a huge say in terms of the overall earnings profile. Uh, so, yes, yeah, strong set of numbers. I think this is one of the stocks that we've liked in the past. Continue liking it. A lot, uh, you know, a lot of talk around paper companies and, and, you know, how some of these have been performing. So, you know, be it a JK paper, which has been on the buy list of quite a few of the analysts, an international paper also has picked up in terms of their price action. So from a level of about 400 odd, uh, international paper has moved up to about 516 uh, in the last one and a half month or so. And the other one is West Coast paper. That too has seen incremental interest on the buy side. Uh, whether or not any of these stocks are worth trading in, I'll come to Mayuresh on, uh, on the fundamentals and whether or not it makes sense to enter into these stocks from a long-term perspective. But just a quick word, uh, hey, Adrian, from you first. Yeah, West Coast paper, uh, you know, we have seen a very strong move and, uh, you know, it is followed by a consolidation, which is a very uh, positive development. Uh, we are seeing a flag pattern being developed, uh, you know, uh, because of the consolidation that uh, has been followed because, uh, uh, post uh, the strong up move. I think uh, 408410 is very important on the upside, uh, you know, above which we could see a very strong flag pattern breakout. So if someone is considering to uh, accumulate a stock around these levels, one can definitely, uh, you know, use this sideways move to actually gradually uh, accumulate West Coast paper. On the upside, uh, above the breakout of 410 levels, we could see a very fast uh, up move uh, towards uh, 430 to 435. So definitely West Coast paper, uh, you know, seems to be a very good uh, uh, stock with a medium term perspective. Hirish, your take on paper? So pulp prices globally have been moving higher and northwards uh, and what you've probably seen specifically for domestic paper manufacturers uh, have been that the input costs uh, have probably been far more stable, more or less with the forestry and the farming uh, specifically that has been mandated by the government. Uh, the second element obviously in terms of realizations moving higher and input costs staying lower have reflected very, very positively in terms of uh, both the EBIT and the EBIT margins. Uh, and that has created the necessary leverage onto the balance sheet. The third element, obviously, is that the capacity additions uh, have not been so pronounced over the last few quarters and years. Uh, so the utilization levels at which these paper companies are working on 
are at optimum levels. Uh, so to that bit, I think the leverage probably gets played on their balance sheet as well. The fourth element obviously has been uh, the kind of ban that the Chinese authorities have done in terms of uh, low quality uh, waste paper. So that obviously also has a huge say. And the other element in terms of uh, the government actually exploring options in terms of both coated and uncoated uh, imports that are probably coming in through the Asian countries. Uh, so to that bit, any, any positive development on that front obviously gives a huge impetus uh, in terms of the local manufacturers, uh, specifically the coated, uncoated uh, players and even the packaging board players because e-commerce uh, again is picking up in a huge, huge way. Now input cost specifically, I think what happens in terms of water and special chemicals because water is also a critical element and what we probably see in below average monsoons is going to be the risk factor. But numbers have been stellar at least for the next few quarters, uh, printing, writing, both in terms of uh, coated paper as well as uncoated, including the package board paper, are expected to show reasonable and exponential growth. Uh, so yes, I think stocks uh, like an international paper that you mentioned, JK paper, uh, even to a certain bit Orient paper look very, very interesting. But one really needs to be hit for declines and again invest in a staggered way. Uh, so I think that that's the take on paper. You know, just some PSUs and the numbers thereof. Remember the two banks, BOI and Yuko Bank, the losses widened, so that stayed wide. Uh, Coal India, the numbers act adjusted for one-offs seem to be in line or slightly better than estimates, So, which is why maybe the stock is reacting positively. Difficult to give a view here, but Mayuresh, if I can peg you to a 30-second view, just minutes away from market open, but a quick view on Nalco because it is another strong quarter. What would you do here? No, very strong quarter, but again, there is an if and ifs and offs in terms of what happens with the Alunod facility and what kind of pricing trends uh, does Alumina probably reflect. Uh, but again, very, very strong dynamics in terms of the captive bauxite mines where properly cut, uh, in terms of uh, what they're probably doing in terms of the Angul smelting plant, what probably happens in terms of the coal linkage specifically for its power operations and what probably happens in terms of utilization levels for its smelting operations. Aluminium realizations obviously are a huge say in terms of demand supply and valuations are very, very attractive at 3.3 times EV bit type 520. So yes, I think there are uh, interesting times for an Alco. The perspective in terms of valuations is very, very supportive. But again, I think investors who are probably looking at a fresh entry has to look at these factors. So wait for declines. Any investor holding on to the stock should continue. Okay. Mayuresh, we'll leave it at that. Thanks so much for taking the time out and being with us today. Thank I appreciate you so your time. Much. Thank you. That's the view from Mayuresh Joshi on a bunch of stocks, really. But minutes away from market open, let's tell you all that you need to know to stay ahead in trade today. Two of the last few nifty names reporting earnings today include Sun Pharma and Tata Steel. Apollo Tires, Ashok Leyland and Glenmark are other non-index names which will be reporting numbers today. Among yesterday's results, Aurobindo Pharma, BOI, Yuko Bank, JK Paper, Nalco, uh, Brigade, Jindal Saw and Gen Irrigation reported strong numbers. While Aisha Motors, Jet Airways, Oil India, Apex Frozen Foods and Hathaway Cables reported a weak set of numbers. Coal India was expected to report a strong quarter and it did so. Adjusted EBITDA margin of the company rose to 21.3% from 4.8% in the corresponding quarter last year. And good news for shareholders of Oil India, the board will consider a buyback of shares on November 19th. The company has gross cash and cash equivalents worth 5,253 crore rupees. And NBCC received an order for construction of an Ayurveda Institute in Goa for 260 crore rupees. Well, that's interesting. Okay, um, Dhananja Sinha, I'm told, Head of Research, Economics and Strategist at MK Global Financial Services is with us as well. Dhananja, always good having you. Thanks so much for joining in. Start off with a bit of a micro and then we'll go on to the macro view as well, Dhananja, but just minutes away from market open. Just need to know, how do you approach some of these PSU banks, the mid-sized ones, whether in PCA or otherwise, who are reporting numbers which are chalk and cheese? Asset quality is improving, but losses are widening. What would you do out here? So the thing is that uh, I think there is a lot of uh, confusion as far as the or uncertainty as far as the banking and uh, BFSI sector is concerned as at a broader level. Uh, I think uh, um, the good way to really uh, consider this is that you know we have to really look at the structural story and clearly in that structural story uh, we are seeing that uh, private sector banks are gaining market shares. They are having good amount of uh, growth capital. There is an expansion in margin that is happening on select names. Uh, and and uh, as a as a general uh, sort of 
uh, a short term trend there is an improvement in asset quality uh, and, and concerns are sort of fading out so i think if you look at this set of companies i think they are generally doing well i think there is a flavor for some of the uh, banks that were considered to be corporate banks so uh, there is a good amount of momentum and interest that is showing up out there uh, as far as the uh, psu banks are concerned uh, i think uh, it's a mixed bag um, you know uh, uh, overall it's a function of the the growth which has been fairly uh, fairly mild and um, because they they lack the growth capital the other aspect is of course there is some improvement in the in in, in the concern on on asset quality i think that is a sort of a, a function of whatever you know uh, sort of provisioning that they have done earlier and 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 the incremental uh, slippage that is happening that is somewhat lesser so i think that is there but apart from that um, you know there is a sort of a you know impact of the higher mark to market losses uh, uh, because of the yield curve uh, steepening and uh, of course uh, in a in a context where there is a, a uncertainty with respect to uh, currency movement i think there is the sentiment in 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 uh, is somewhat against the psu banking stock so that is another aspect and i would say that uh, uh, if, if you look at the uh, you know uh, the 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 issues that are confronting the government the rbi the nbfcs etc there does seem to be a scenario where um, where some of the psu banks will be indulging in in uh, directed uh, lending or directed allocation uh, so if you look at all those concerns i would say that it will be still be fortunate to stay away from most of the psu stocks Within the NBFC space, I think this, uh, uh, you know, there, there does Dananja, seem. Dhananjay, I'll allow us. Yeah. Dhananjay, I'll allow us to come in. We just 20 seconds away from market open. We'll have this view on the NBFC space coming just moments from now. But quick five second calls each from both of you. Hadrian, your top call for the day today. Yeah, sell TVS Motor. Expecting a target of 525 on the downside and a stop loss at 546 on the upside. Okay, I think I'll have to take Amit's call after market open. TVS Motors is the call from here, and we'll take in the other calls in just moments from now. But the markets have just kick-started, so let's focus on them first. About a third of a percent lower for the Nifty 50, about Nifty Bank to about half a percent. So this is more in line with what the SGX Nifty was indicating. Let's see if this worsens or it stays at these levels. The mid caps and the small cap indices should also come up on your screen. Yeah, not surprising that the mid caps have started off weak. The small caps will be lackluster right now. I think they will uh, start falling a little bit if the market stays soft. In in due course, in the next 15, 20 odd minutes, the heat map, a fair bit of red. Tata Motors, the top loser. I should reacting, by the way, to its numbers, two and a half percent lower. There is weakness in information technology marginally in the session today. Yesterday's top gainer, but today in forces and the likes are looking slightly wobbly today. But financials, it is for a second day on a trot, which are looking wobbly. Kotak, Indabul Housing Finance, Yes Bank, rate sensitives essentially at the bottom of the pile. What's doing well? Well, crude softened a bit. And well, HPBP, IOC. You know, I, I feel bad for some of the positional traders who might have taken some short calls yesterday. If the stocks have started off well, I don't know if stop losses get triggered here or no. Coal India starting marginally higher on the count of what was a better than expected or in line with, but a good quarter. ONGC marginally higher, but aside of that, no big moves. Frankly, the newsmakers have just moving on news. Arisha Motors as well as Tata Motors. Quickly. Two or three pockets that I want to highlight before I hand it over to the winner for what's happening across the board. Firstly, Jet Airways naturally so will come up on your screen. Hasn't reacted all that badly. The losses have mounted, but maybe crude softened, or maybe it was in the price. Uh, the stock marginally in the green, which is well an interesting move from Jet Airways side. What else? Uh, some losers from yesterday's session, and let's see how they are doing. Not too bad. All three: Avanti Feeds, OBC, as well as India Cements, which were amongst the top losers, start off. Just about marginally weak today. Okay, what about result reactions? Let me try and see if there is some big reaction on any of the other results. No, not quite. JK Paper is the only one which is making a decisive, which is making a move which is worth noticing. Aurobindo marginally higher. Nalco, in fact, very flat. So, well, I'm not striking it great, Devina. Are you spotting any big movers? Well, aside from the ones that you already mentioned, Godrej Industries reported its uh, Q2 numbers. Net profits were up 72%. Came in at closer to 135 crores. The stock's up about 2.6 percent. Other one from the PSA banking lot was Bank of India reported numbers immediately post market shut shop. Uh, numbers probably disappointing. The street 85 on the stock down. Yuko Bank is the other one. Uh, it had a net loss of about 1,136 crores. Stock's down 2.23 percent. We already spoke about a JK paper and Nalco Oil India is the other one and um, a Brigade Enterprises on the back of earnings. Um, 
Nalco is down flat. Brigade and Press up 4%. They reported a net profit of growth of about 67%. Aside from that, what's making moves? We have Interglobe Aviation following suit with what Jet Airways is doing. So the entire aviation basket seems to be okay in the session right now, 2.5% higher. Oil India, Godrej Industries, we spoke about these on the back of results. Thermax is up 1.5%. Kansai Nerolac is up 1.3%. Polo Tires is up 1% at 216 uh, Seat following suit. Um, then you've got an India Bulls real estate up uh, closer to a percent. Siemens up half a percent. Amaraja batteries up half a percent. Biocon is up half a percent as well. JSPL, Tor and Pharma, some of the names which have gained but not any significant gains. Bank of India among the bigger losers. JSW Energy is down uh, two percent. Karur Vaisya Bank, Jubilant Food Works at 1,085. Persistent is down as well, one and a quarter. Atara Communications, 8CC, and LNT Finance Holdings down 1%. Okay. Amit Harchekar, um, opening thoughts on the index, and we, we couldn't get a chance to get in your top idea for the day. Maybe you can tell us about that too. Well, I would uh, be quite negative on even IT. Infosys would be my, uh, I'm expecting Infosys to move towards 625, 630. So it becomes a good shorting candidate even at these levels. Stop loss for your short trade is 685. We think the stock has completed a uh, running triangle on the upside. So the next move has to be down. Index, we think, uh, as I said, we are, we are not taking an aggra aggressive trade on either side. The moment Nifty Future breaks 10,400, that only would give a confirmation to initiate a fresh short trade. Till then, we, we believe that Nifty could be into this range of 10,410 to 520 on the upside. Mm. Hadrian? Uh, all right, uh, Hadrian's not with us. I mean, just one follow-up, uh, and I wanted to particularly pick up some of these tyre stocks. Last few days have not been bad. Apollo Tyres, Seat, they've been doing okay for themselves. Any interest that looks like there could be a significant upside on any of these names? Well, uh, the formation for Apollo Tire is quite negative. In fact, uh, after yesterday's move, it has given a confirmation uh, uh, that a bearish triangle has been completed here and the stock would be heading lower towards 202, 201. So, from a trading perspective, a 225 remains the stop loss for your short trade and one should initiate short uh, for a target of 200. Okay. We leave it at that, Amit. Thanks very much for joining us. Appreciate you taking out the time. Uh, Dhanan Jasin is still here with us. Dhananjay, so far, um, down the earnings season, we're almost approaching the fag end of the earnings season. What have you read into it like and uh, have there been more disappointments for you than positive surprises? So I think uh, if you look at the aggregate uh, picture, there does seem to be a sort of a contraction in earnings. Uh, if, you look at the, if you look at the adjusted path for uh, non-bank and non-oil and gas sector, uh, for Nifty there is a con contraction and so is the case with uh, uh, you know, for for uh, Sensex, so I think uh, with respect to expectation, uh, clearly the surprise is negative. And if you look at the overall uh, full year estimate, uh, there has been a scaling down, um, a scaling down of estimates. I think the consensus is somewhere in the region of uh, 15 to 18 percent. I guess there will be further scaling down. Start of the year, we started with consensus expectation growth of of over 25 percent. So I think this is uh, a sort of a trend that is continuing for the past, uh, past several years. So I think uh, this year also it is, is likely to be no different. So the, the downgrade cycle will continue as far as earnings concerned. concerned. Uh, secondly, I think from a positive standpoint, um, we saw a sort of a, a better earnings growth from some of the staple uh, companies uh, because of the, uh, of the soft uh, uh, raw material price, especially with respect to food items, so that's reflected also in the contraction in the or a deflation in, in uh, CPI in food component. Uh, so there is a sort of decline out there. But uh, apart from that, uh, there is a sort of a impact of uh, rising raw material cost uh, for most of the sectors and margins is actually decrease. So you know, while top line appears to be uh, decent, I think uh, there is a margin pressure that is coming around uh, uh, quite uh, uh, on a widespread basis. So I think that's the uh, broad, uh, you know, takeaway from, uh, from, the, from the results. I think some of the export-led uh, sectors such as IT and select, uh, you know, 
uh, auto names which have uh, IT components and uh, sorry export components and also with some components in capital, capital goods so which are export oriented and some companies that are uh, dependent on government uh, spending um, especially LNT and those kind of ABB etc um, have actually shown uh, some positivity but by and large uh, the earning season has been uh, less than estimate for for sure. Mm. Dhananjay, as I look at the screen, the auto stocks stand out for more for the losses that they are suffering. Tata Motors, yet another day of a downtick. The two-wheeler companies have been under pressure too. Um, what is standing out for you as an index name within the auto space, either on the upside or on the downside? I mean, are you guys negative, still negative on Tata Motors? Are you turning marginally bullish uh, on, say, a Maruti Suzuki? What are you telling your clients to do with the two-wheeler names? So on the two wheelers names, I think uh, you know uh, Bajaj is uh, one uh, one stock that can do better because of the export uh, export components that we have. As far as two wheelers are concerned, there is a decent amount of volume growth that is still happening. I think there is a margin compression that is there that is visible. So I think if you look at uh, Hero Motors, also seem to be doing uh, fairly well as far as volume is concerned. As far as Maruti is concerned, um, you know, with a fall in prices by almost like 30 percent, um, we, uh, we think it is a good, uh, a good, good bet uh, from a longer term standpoint. I think, uh, uh, you know, Tata Motors is corrected quite a bit. Uh, it, it has been, uh, you know, exposed to a lot of headwinds, uh, especially from the U.S. And so where the volume growth has been actually been disappointing. I think the stock has actually come down substantially, uh, uh, I think somewhere around 185 or thereabout. You know, it's a fairly uh, uh, you know, deep value at this juncture. I'm not saying that it can't go down further, but from a longer term standpoint, it is, it is looking good. Um, uh, Mother Sun also has a, a significant, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, external uh, sales component, which can also uh, be be doing well, so that's a sort of view on the on the on the uh, auto side. iShare has actually been disappointing, uh, and the results uh, also yesterday was not uh, fairly uh, was negative surprise. So there is a margin compression that is happening, and volume growth is also sort of slackening. So I think iShare is something that that I would somewhat be cautious about. Uh, what about the battery space? The likes of uh, and Exide and Amar Raja, would this space interest you? So I think uh, you know, you know, there is a good amount of OEM uh, volume uh, support that is there uh, as far as the you know, the battery space is concerned. I think Exide looks uh, somewhat better. So uh, there is a gain in market share that they have exhibited in the recent uh, recent uh, period. So I think. Uh, that is uh, that is a favorable thing for Excite. Interesting. Dhananjay, uh, before the market opened, you were talking about NBFCs. Uh, it's a bit of a litmus test the next few days with the rollovers, etc. Uh, do you expect only the stronger names to find favor? Or if the storm passes, then some of the beaten down names could also uh, start garnering some investor attention. What would you tell some of your top clients? So, so the thing is that uh, we are ne we have been negative on NBFC space for last uh, almost like last one year since November of 2017, uh, and this has largely been driven by our view that there has been a significant ALM mismatch match they have been running, uh, and uh, with a tightening in interest rate cycle, they would actually be uh, be squeezed out. I think uh, what is what we are seeing is a combination of uh, liquidity issue, margin compression, and also a rising credit cost uh, because of uh, uh, weak uh, underwriting, especially for NBFCs that have been exposed to uh, developer finance in the real estate sector. My sense is that uh, this will continue. Um, you know, while RBI and the government are sort of debating on what should be the be the right path and, and the government is definitely pressurizing them uh, on, on, a, on, on, a, on a, a proper resolution. Uh, my sense is that the RBI has already given certain line of uh, 
of liquidity through the banking system. I think that should continue. But I think the amount of rollovers and redemptions that are that are that are that are lined up is substantial, uh, and hence my sense is that not all of this will be addressed in a short period of time. And hence I would continue to uh, avoid uh, NBFC space, uh, which are in companies which are engaged in in uh, uh, in developer finance uh, financing. I think. Uh, we, uh, you know where we will find value as things settle down is is uh, are, are those NBFCs that are engaged in consumer lending, etc. Such as Bajaj, uh, uh, which can actually uh, be seen uh, as a as a structural play over a longer period of time. Okay, Tananjay, one final question from my end. Uh, oil circa yeah. 70. What does this do to calls on aviation at all? Because they have now stopped reacting to bad news. Jet Airways is not correcting on what was a howler of a quarter. Intergroup Aviation too marginally in the green. Probably a re re probably the reason that I could fathom is that crude is slight come off slightly as well. What do you do with the aviation pack, if anything? So we don't have a coverage out there, but uh, my sense is that uh, you know the stock, the, the sector was. Uh, was was uh, under a lot of stress because of the rise in crude prices, uh, and uh, you know you had rupee depreciation also impacting them. I think some of this is has uh, has worn off with uh, decrease in the crude oil prices recently. There is a sort of uh, 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 sort of a news of uh, increased supply and and U.S. Uh, President Donald Trump um, actually. Uh, Indicating that uh, the OPEC should not cut back on production, uh, etc. So I think those are some positive news for the aviation sector from a cost standpoint. Uh, I am not very sure this is going to sustain for a for a very long period of time. I don't have a very uh, clear view on oil, but uh, I think uh, uh, the rupee will undergo further depreciation, and uh, and that will sort of uh, compound the problem. So I think uh, the 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 stocks in this sector may react uh, to the decrease in the oil prices but i think eventually uh, i am not very i think the uncertainty remains with respect to the outlook on oil prices and also uh, i am fairly sure that the dollar that rupee will actually weaken so i think put together i would say you know uh, one would uh, would not expect a significant run up in this sector at this juncture real estate seems to have fallen out of flavor I mean, there have been talks of how uh, many of these developers could face the liquidity crunch if they don't get funding uh, from uh, the relevant NBFCs. What's your take here? I mean, nonetheless, uh, there is a huge inventory pile up. They need to monetize that in order to make sure that uh, development doesn't come to a standstill. What's your sense here, Dhananjay, and whether or not any of them make for a good investment, probably the likes of an overall realty for that matter? So no. So the thing is that uh, uh, at this juncture, I would still be avoiding the real estate. I mean, we don't have a coverage, but I think the concern with respect to the uh, with respect to the NPFC space should definitely start reflecting on the on the developer uh, uh, developers' operation. Uh, and uh, so uh, my sense is that uh, unless um, you know the real estate players. Uh, eventually start to sort of push more sales through lower prices uh, and and uh, so you know the cash flow will will be a concern for them eventually they that's what they will end up doing if the if the developer finances uh, financing dry out so i think uh, that's an eventual thing we'll have to see how how this pans out so i would still be avoiding this se this sector all right anything else that you would like uh, you know to talk about dhananjay specific to what you're liking so I think uh, you know we have been talking about the IT space also where there has been a sort of a correction in stocks uh, and and we think that there has been a certain reasonable valuation that uh, that some of the stocks have actually come up uh, come down to so HCL tech is something which has been our flavor uh, favor favorite stock within that uh, you know in a in a mid cap we have intellect design uh, within the banking sector you know we are still. Uh, having stronger conviction on ICSA Bank, which has been our top pick, and HDFC Bank. Uh, so uh, that is that is on the 
on the on the banking space i think uh, uh, within the uh, pharma space we have been liking aurobindo as well so i think these are some of the aurobindo and dr reddys so i think these are the uh, some of the conviction ideas that we have yeah you know just before i thank you though just want to mark a couple of questions and just one last question that i do have but i want to mark what's happening to bank of india and uco bank as well so while the asset quality numbers may have looked marginally better but i think i'm just taking on board dhananjay's point about how the stress in the system at least especially for the smaller names doesn't seem to have gone out and it's showing in the way the these banks have reacted so the first few set of mid size psu banks came out with reasonable asset qualities and good numbers the last few names indian bank uco bank bank of india they've all been struggling and coming apart at the seams so there is a little bit of an issue out there on those names for sure um danjay my final question and that's uh, related to how does one play any of the agrarian pockets considering the long standing commentary over the last 6 months has been the growth in the rural income the msp hikes and therefore that and if indeed the direct transfer of money has to happen then that there is more money at the hands of the rural consumer and the farmer and obviously where he spends is where the earnings would come in over the next 6 to 9 odd months how are you playing that so i think we have been uh, sort of overweight rural team uh, especially on the consumption side for the last one and a half years uh, i think uh, what i am realizing now we have to really segregate uh, this space and we have to divide the ru wider rural uh, sort of demand and the ag agrarian uh, uh, agrarian sector i think uh, the agrarian sector is still under uh, distress uh, that's reflected in the a uh, decline in realization of agriculture produce uh, uh, varying from uh, vegetables fruits milk uh, and also uh, uh, other uh, cash crops so i think you know pulses for instance so i think there is a sort of a uh, distress as far as realization is concerned we have already seen um, you know costs rising and so the cost of cultivation would have increased so i think the margin pressure has been there with respect to cereals while the msp increase was very uh, high uh, you know somewhere around 15 or percent 12 to 15 percent i think that's not really reflecting still on the cereal uh, price inflation so that's still about 2% or there about so i think the effectiveness of msp increases on a wider um, or whatever the government is doing at a wider um, agri uh, agriculture level is not really reflected in terms of the farm sector economics also we are seeing that in various uh, parts of the of the country there is a deficiency as far as uh, um, uh, precip uh, you know monsoon is concerned so i think uh, there are uh, issues out there so maharashtra for instance is asking for special package for the for the uh, agriculture sector so i think the agrarian part is still under under stress i think as far as the rural is concerned i think um, there is good amount of government allocation that has been happening you know through manrega or other entitlement schemes that has been actually flowing into the demand so i think uh, you see some of that reflecting in 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 the uh, in the auto auto numbers so wow. i think uh, uh, the reason there has to be a segregation apart from that you know the staple companies have also hcl etc have also given a positive commentary as far as rural demand is concerned the the third angle that has to be really looked at is a lowering of uh, food items as far as raw material costs is concerned has actually reflected positively on on margins of some of the staple companies such as britannia mm. uh, uh, nestle or merico so i think uh, it's a sort of a mix of it so we would not be so gungo about the agrarian stocks especially in the agro uh, agrochemicals and agro input space versus uh, right. versus the agrarian uh, versus the rural place right got that uh dhananjay really appreciate you taking out the time uh and sharing your thoughts and views with us here on the show uh we're out of time on this segment but uh, we're going to be taking a short break markets look pretty okay flat for the time being they've recovered from the lows of the day yeah on the other side corporate conversations uh hita shobaroy of info edge as well as anil gupta of ka industries stay tuned to bloomberg quick live
गुड न्यूज गाइज गोर अ प्रमोशन एंड अ डैम गुड रेज कॉन्ग्रेट्स बेटा कॉन्ग्रेट्स मेरी तरफ से भी फ्रॉम मामा टू वाह रेज अब तो इंश्योरेंस पॉलिसी ले ले इंश्योरेंस कौन सी कंपनी से लू सोचना क्या चूज वही जिस पर हो पूरा भरोसा वीरू गो फॉर कन्वीनियंस माय कंपनी ऑनलाइन क्विक एंड सिंपल बेटा बट पॉलिसी समझाएगा कौन वेबसाइट पे सब है पापा आई कैन इवन कॉल एन आस्क क्लेम सेटलमेंट का रेशो क्या है मेरी कंपनी का 98% एट परसेंट ऐसी ज्यादा है That's good, but आज की जनरेशन वॉन्ट एवरी थिंग ऑनलाइन इजी प्रीमियम पेमेंट ऑप्शन लोन फैसिलिटीज और वाइड रेंज ऑफ प्रोडक्ट अरे पापा दीदी आई विल डिसाइड जस्ट सेंड योर लिंक्स ना तुम दोनों भी ना सेम चॉइस एल आई सी एल आई सी ट्रेंडिंग विथ टाइम्स बासठ सालों से हर जनरेशन की पसंद We need a lot of patience yeah. into the next industry cycle. Short-term pains for long-term gains. Buying is complicated. Selling is ten times more complicated. If making money for investors were an art form, these folks would be maestros. Statistically speaking, there is likely to be a big drawdown sometime in the next six to twelve months. Is it much more difficult getting stocks right now? I think that is the basic nature of investing. Equity reflects the future earning potential. Circle of competence, one of the most important concepts in investing. Biggest risk that investor takes is when he pays the highest valuation at the highest margins. Get in on a conversation on the art of investing with India's top portfolio managers on Alpha Moguls Thursdays only on Bloomberg Quint. Welcome back. You're watching in open right here on Bloomberg Quint. On to some corporate news. Then, Infoage is one of the first companies to bet on India's digital boom. Starting operations in 1995 with Nokri.com, it has added more key portals like Zomato and 99acres.com to its kitty over the years. While some of these are already market leaders in their respective spaces, it does leave a little room for growth, especially in such a hyper-competitive market. So, what's Infoage's strategy going forward? Let's ask Hitesh. Obroy, the MD and CEO of the company. Hirish, thanks very much for taking out the time and speaking with us. Uh, you know, while we probably will take a look at your quarterly performance as well, but the main idea is to take a look into the next few quarters and probably the growth strategy of the company down the line and where you intend to focus all your energies on to make sure that growth is sustainable. Yeah, so you know, InfoEdge is basically two different sort of uh, companies in some sense. We have an operating business, uh, and you know, under InfoEdge we run Nokri.com, 99 Acres, Jeevan Sathi, and Shiksha. These are uh, businesses we own and manage 100%. And then we have an investment sort of arm where we have uh, been investing in startups outside for many years. Uh, for example, we own uh, a large chunk of Zomato, we own a small chunk of Policy Bazaar, and we have maybe 10 or 12 other investments in startups outside. Uh, so the strategy of the company is very clear uh, to sort of uh, get to clear leadership uh, in all the categories uh, we operate and run ourselves, uh, like uh, Nokri, 99 Acres, Jeevan Sathi, and Shiksha, and uh, of course to sort of maximize returns from our uh, investment portfolio over time. So Nokri is our is our main business. 70% of our revenue, almost all our profits come from Nokri, and these profits, uh, uh, you know, are being plowed back one into growing the Nokri business. Two into growing the 99 acres business where we are a clear leader today. Uh, three getting growth uh, 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 back in in Jeevan Sathi and Chiksha, and also sort of uh, these funds are also being used to invest outside in startups. Right? And, and you know, as the economy recovers, uh, uh, as sort of uh, employment uh, picks up, as real estate picks up, uh, you know, we expect all these sort of businesses to do well going forward. Let's talk about revenue targets that you have for each each of these platforms. Uh, you know whether it be Nokri, whether it be 99 acres. I mean, this quarter was a little bit disappointing on the revenue side. And what your big grand plans for Zomato are to take it to, uh, you know, the numero uno position? Yeah, 
Yes, you see, the Nokri and 19 acres business are very closely indexed to what happens in the economy. Uh, the job market was tight for a few years. Uh, IT companies are not hiring uh, till a few quarters ago. But the last two quarters have now been very, pretty good for Nokri. Uh, collection growth has been uh, up 17-18%. Billing growth last quarter was upwards of 26% uh, in jobs. Uh, com IT companies are back to hiring once again. So in the near term, you know, if IT companies continue to hire and the economy continues to grow at 7-7.5%, uh, we expect uh, the Nokri business to sort of uh, chug along nicely uh, in, 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 in along, you know, in, in, in with these kind of rate growth rates. Uh, but you know, like I said, a lot depends on the economy. If things slow down because of the elections or because of uh, high inflation or anything else that happens, or if IT hiring slows down for some reason because of what happens in the US, uh, we, we, we don't know what will happen. But, but if the environment continues to be benign, then Nokri should juggle along nicely uh, in the 15 to 20% sort of range. Uh, as far as 9 acres is concerned, uh, the real estate market was very tight for the last few years. Uh, demonetization, RERA, GST, uh, you know, projects not being completed on time, all these things had a big impact on the market. There was a lot of unsold inventory. Even today, uh, uh, you know, builders, uh, many builders have sort of are going bankrupt, they're short of cash, they're not able to complete projects. Having said that, you know, despite all these, for the last two quarters, we've grown our business at about 35-40% uh, in 19 acres. In fact, billing growth last quarter was close to 50%. Uh, so, so the, if the interest rate environment continues to be benign, if uh, builders are not short of, are not starved of funds, uh, and if prices stay steady, which is what they've been for the last few years, we expect at least uh, you know the growth in the real estate sort of business to also be uh, be strong. Uh, but things change pretty rapidly in India. One can't be sure. Uh, so, so one has to wait and watch and see what happens. Uh, as far as uh, the Jeevan Sathi is concerned, you know, our focus is more on, on, on growing volumes at this point in time. We are not a clear leader in this category, we are a number three player, we are a strong number two in the north, uh, but our focus right now is to gain share, uh, and especially volume share, so that we can get the network effect going in all our businesses. So here we are focused more on sort of uh, the long term health of the business, uh, and less on actually profitability and growth targets at this point in time. Shiksha is a, is a small business uh, doing well, breaking even, uh, generating about $78 million a year. So these are the internal businesses we have and these are the broad targets for them. As far as Zomato is concerned, it's a very competitive market. Uh, Zomato is sort of a very, very strong player in the restaurant reviews and ratings business. Uh, they, are very strong, they have a very strong product in the form of Zomato, sort of gold which is doing very well in the market. Uh, some of their international operations are chugging along nicely, some are uh, under a, a bit of pressure. Uh, on the food delivery side, uh, food ordering and food delivery side, they've done a fantastic job over the last few quarters. Uh, literally from nowhere, they're now sort of uh, almost as big as uh, the other player in, in the market. Uh, yes, the company is, is losing a lot of money, but it's growing rapidly. Uh, and uh, let, So let's see how this plays out over time. 20% growth in Nokri, 35% in 99 acres. I'm sorry if you uh, missed out Zomato. Could you give me a ballpark that you expect Zomato to grow by? Actually, very hard to predict what's going to happen in Zomato because, you know, uh, the, the growth is crazy, actually. So it's very hard to say what's going to happen. Maybe the business will double, triple, quadruple, who knows? I mean, a lot will depend on how much uh, sort of uh, funding is available, uh, what the competitive intensity is like, and uh, how many new products they launch and sort of how fast they scale up. Uh, for I mean, literally from like uh, a few thousand delivery boys, uh, you know, if, uh, yeah, literally from a few thousand, they now, I think, have 70,000 or so. Uh, and all this has happened in the last uh, you know, year or two. So, so you know, it's very hard to predict what growth is going to be like in Zomato. Uh, it, it's growing rapidly month on month is all I can say. Hitesh, uh, let's talk about the here and now. Uh, good quarter on the revenues front, but margin pressures out there in order to ward off competition. Uh, would these pressures stay? Yeah, so we, know we are committed to the long-term health of the business. Uh, you know, we don't really look at uh, margins from quarter on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Uh, uh, you know, we are investing aggressively in product development. Uh, we are aggressing investing, you know, aggressing, uh, sorry, investing aggressively in, in new areas like machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, to improve the user experience on our platforms. Uh, we are uh, launching new products uh, in, in, in jobs. Uh, you know, we also sort of want to ensure that our brand stays strong, so we've upped our investment in, in marketing and, and branding. 
so this is what is required at this stage uh, to sort of uh, uh, you know build a strong business business in the long run. So this means a temporary dip in margins. Uh, so be it. Uh, you know, on the other hand, if uh, if we if we continue to grow strongly on the uh, on the you know top line front, I mean, uh, margins may not be impacted to that extent. But that we will have to wait and see what happens. Which is a which is a fair point, Itesh. But just wondering uh, that, do you reckon that an average for FY19 uh, could be sub about sub 35, 34 percent, or maybe around close to 31, 32 percent, which you logged in in Q2? Yeah, so we will we will continue to invest strongly in marketing and branding. We will continue to stro invest strongly in product development, uh, technology, and research. Uh, so our costs are going to go up for sure. Now, what the margins uh, the margins we will end up with will be a function of what kind of revenue we're able to generate, you know, uh, over the next two quarters. Uh, so if revenue growth looks up, margins may not come under that much pressure. But if revenue con growth continues to be like it was in the first uh, half of the year, then certainly we will end the year with lower margins. Hmm. Interesting. Um, is 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 competition looking like it will keep uh, players and leaders like you on tenter hooks as well, uh, and therefore need for more advertisements, not just over the next couple of quarters, but over the next 18 odd months? I mean, surely you're looking far out for the next three, four, five years. Does it look like the competitive intensity is picked up so much that it'll keep you under check uh, on the competitive pressures for the near future? Well, actually, yes and no. See, what's happening out there is that the competition from the players we were competing with earlier is no longer very strong, right? Uh, but the nature of the internet is such that uh, you get new players from time to time, uh, players which could be disruptive potentially if you don't sort of, uh, you know, keep your eye on the ball. So we need to watch out for such sort of players. Also, what is happening now is that the number of people on the internet is growing, right? So, it was, you know, from 100, 200 million people a few years ago, we're talking about 300, 400 million people. Uh, so, so, therefore, the opportunity to sort of grow faster is uh, is also there today, right? But the the, tr the, the truth about the invest uh, about the internet is that you know, the internet in companies like ours, especially which are marketplaces, you know, uh, we need to invest in product, technology, brand. We can't capitalize these investments. These investments are of operational in nature, so we sort of uh, you know charge them off every time we make them. Uh, so these need to be made upfront for the future, right? In the hope that you know these will result in sort of new areas of growth uh, and faster growth going forward. So that's really the hope right now. Uh, we are banking on the fact that there are new opportunities and that if we invest right now, then over the next three or four years, irrespective of competition, uh, we will grow faster. But, but let's see what happens. Just one last question, Hitesh, before we let you go. Uh, you know, from a shareholder perspective, where is the next leap of growth uh, for InfoEdge? Where does it come from? You know, like I mentioned earlier, we are, uh, uh, you know, Nokri continues to be a cash grow, and we continue, and we are sort of hoping that we can continue to grow Nokri fast, and Nokri will therefore keep generating a lot of cash, and this cash will be used to fuel growth uh, in the other categories which we are sort of uh, present in, uh, like 99 acres, very large market potentially uh, was tight, was a tight market for many years, but now growth is slowly coming back. We are a leader, but not as dominant as we are in Nokri. Uh, so, so this is an area of investment for us, and this can actually get us a lot of growth going forward if we do a good job. Matrimony, there is scope for us to sort of improve our performance over, over in the long run. And then our investments outside, you know, so Zomato and Policy Bazaar have done very well over the last uh, few years uh, in terms of valuations. Uh, and we are now investing aggressively in new, in new startups as well. So, so that will also, also sort of get us, uh, you know, maybe growth over a period of time. Leave it at that, Hitesh. Thank you so much for taking the time out and joining us, and all the best for the quarters Over ahead. To there will be MA opportunities. Sorry, yeah. please make your point. Thank you. You know, the last point I was making was that they, you know uh, uh, we expect some MA opportunities to also arise over the next few years. There is nothing that we're looking at specifically at this point in time. But if there are opportunities, then we will grab those opportunities as well. Um, I'm sure you do that. And maybe the cash on the books also helps. But it is, um, th take a moment to thank you again for joining in. And all the best for the quarters ahead. Well, that's arguably one of the leaders within uh, this listed digital space uh, talking about what the quarters ahead could look like. Uh, let's get in uh, yet another perspective from a corporate uh, KEI Industries. They've embarked on a new CapEx plan 
company will invest close to 60 crore rupees in a new facility which will be ready by March 2019. Lest it seems small, they're already sitting on a fairly large capacity that they're operating under and therefore it'll add about 3 lakh kilometers per annum of capacity. Let's discuss these plans and the impact thereof with the Chairman and MD Mr. Anil Gupta. He joins us right now on the show. Good having you Mr. Gupta. Thanks so much for joining in. Um, what does, uh, we will come to the quarter as well, but very quickly on this new CapEx plan that you've announced, uh, does it get commissioned within a particular time frame and does it add revenues immediately to you as a company? Uh, we, we have uh, started this project only in uh, this month, in November. We acquired a new land in Silvasa and uh, uh, in the first phase, we are going to invest around 55 to 60 crore rupees, out of which 25 crore is being spent on land and building. Uh, the uh, machines orders were placed uh, some a few months back, and uh, now uh, the first phase of the project, which will uh, you know cover, which will create a capacity of 3 lakh kilometer of building wires, will be operational by March uh, 2019. So this will add basically the revenue in the next financial year only. Okay. What's the extent of revenue uptick that comes in as a result of this in the next year, Mr. Gupta? Uh, it will add a uh, revenue of around 300 crore rupees in the full, full year. And the second phase of this expansion will also be carried out in 2019-20, uh, which will take another six to eight months to, to be completed. So the second phase of this expansion should be completed by uh, September or October next next year. Okay, so about about 10%, circa 10% to your overall revenues from phase one, and then some more from phase two. Uh, how is growth looking like, Mr. Gupta? You've clocked in about 33% growth in quarter two FY19 at fairly decent margins, maintenance as well. What does the rest of the year look like? We have already given a guide, guidance of, of around 18 to 20 percent in volume growth over a full year period, and uh, we have achieved better in uh, better than that in the first uh, first half. Uh, we we uh, expect to maintain this growth uh, of uh, as guided by us over the full year. Mr. Gupta, uh, good morning to you. Uh, are these uh, uh, capex plans also to keep yourself aligned? Uh, with more orders coming in uh, from Indian railways over the next few years? We are already catering to Indian labors, uh, Indian railways in respect of uh, power cables uh, and to some extent for signaling cables as well. Railway is undergoing a huge uh, capex plan for uh, and undergoing, uh, you know, electrification of huge kilometrage of tracks and it is generating uh, substantial orders for the entire industry um, not only cables but for uh, other equipment makers also so uh, we we are definitely we ex uh, will expecting uh, substantially new more orders from railways in the in the uh, coming quarters and uh, next year as well and that would likely boost your order book by how much in terms of percentages See, uh, it's, I can't uh, quantify it that uh, because we are not executing any turnkey orders for, for railway so far ex ex except some traction substations, uh, but uh, it, will, uh, it will definitely add to revenues by around uh, 3 to 5 percent in the, in the next financial year. Okay, Mr. Gupta, one last question. If most people that we speak to talk about how uh, the next CapEx cycle for India Inc. is around the corner. Obviously, you would be one of the beneficiaries as an ancillary to that CapEx in one way or the other. Do you believe that your operational metrics or your margins could move up from the current block of 9 to 10% to a higher trajectory and sustain there in the years to come, in the next two, three years, that is? We do expect that uh, we are operating at an approximate uh, EBITDA of around 10% at the moment, and we ex uh, expect that it should move move uh, move on by around half a percent to one percent over a period of next one year. So, but uh, we'll be give you a better guidance in the beginning of next financial year.
Okay. We look forward to talking to you then as well. And of course, before that too, when you get some new orders. But Mr. Gupta, uh, thanks so much for taking the time out and joining us and giving us that perspective. That's KEI Industries. Remember, uh, they spoke to us sometime like, very recently, about 20 days back. But then they've announced the CapEx plans and the results. Uh, and the stock reacted to those CapEx plans announcements as well. 366 currently, though, just about muted in the session. The markets today, we now very muted. Flat for the Sensex and the Nifty. The Nifty bank about a third of a percent lower. Yeah, the biggest loss on the index is Tata Motors and that too, just about two odd percent, followed by Bajaj Finance and India Bulls Housing Finance. So, not much in terms of steeper cuts, but uh, nonetheless, the market mood seems to be a little bit more tepid uh, this morning. But with that, uh, it's a wrap on this morning's edition of Indian Open. Thanks a lot for watching from Neeraj, myself and the entire team that put this show together. Coming up next, the Futures and Options Show.